Hello everybody. Welcome to my channel as always. With the 50th anniversary of the White Album coming up, and you know anytime soon, the announcement's going to be made. I'm sure a lot of us are, are, are waiting for that announcement to be made of the box set and what's going to be in the box set. But with the 50th anniversary coming up, I felt today that I would want to talk about one of the most controversial songs in the entire Beatles body of work. The entire catalog. And it's Revolution number nine. Number nine, number nine, number nine. You either love it or you hate it. I still see people saying things like, I skip over that track. I still see people saying it's an abomination. But there's a lot of modern music ensembles that have actually added it to their repertoire. There's a couple of links here in the description that I will put so you can see that but I think it's a masterpiece John was not the only one doing this kind of stuff now we all know that Paul was doing excursions into the avant-garde he still wants to put Carnival of Light out and he still hasn't actually done that but I never felt Revolution 9 was a waste of my time the way George Harrison's electronic sound actually was or two virgins by John and Yoko actually was and is to this day but J John wasn't the only one and I don't know if it's if it's if a lot of Beatle fans are unaccustomed to avant-garde composers that do things with t tape, man um, tape manipulation and concocting whole pieces whole symphonic pieces with nothing but tapes and electronic noise and sound and, and uh, music concrete things like that so I put revolution number nine in the category of Karl Heinz Stockhausen's Song of the Youths Now, another thing. I remember when I read N Nicholas Schaffner's The Beatles Forever. I was always under the impression that John and Yoko did this privately because I believe in The Beatles Forever. He said John and Yoko did it privately and they gave it to George Martin and he was like, no, John, we can't have this on the album. Mark Lewison's The Beatles Recording Sessions book contradicted all of that. It was done at Abbey Road, or at the time EMI Studios. George Martin was there in a producer capacity, even though supposedly it was John controlling everything. They overtook uh, uh, three studios the night all the tape loops were all laid down. And it is a Beatles track. If we're to believe thebeatlesbible.com, there's a quote from George Harrison where he says, Ringo and I compiled that. We went into the tape library and looked through the entire room and pulled main selections and gave the tapes to John. And he cut them together. The whole thing. Number nine. Number nine. Is because I pulled box number nine. John sat there and decided which bits to crossfade together. If Ringo and I hadn't gone there in the first place, he wouldn't have had anything. So in that regard, it's a Beatles track. And that, and the fact that George is actually a part of the spoken word stuff that he and John does, it's a Beatles track coming out of the extended jam that was done on Revolution Number 1, which was faded out on the White Album. Fading that in and out. And it is a Beatles track, in, in my opinion, because of that. Because George and Ringo helped out on it. George did spoken word stuff with John. And, of course, Yoko's on it. And it is supposedly a lot of Yoko influence. But I suspect George Martin had a lot more to do with this track than John wants people to believe. If any of you have the book The Lennon Letters, 
Lenin fired off a nasty letter to George Martin around 1971 or 72 because he saw an interview with George Martin done by, I believe, Russell Hardy, where George Martin was talking about the tape loops on Tomorrow Never Knows and Revolution Number no. 9, and he spe specifically said on Revolution Number no. 9, he, George Martin, was trying to create the music of the future. And John took big offense to that and said, you had absolutely nothing to do with it, but all one has to do is listen to Revolution Number no. 9, then listen to Two Virgins, then listen to Life with the Lions, and listen to the Wedding Album, and you could see the difference between Revolution Number no. 9 and those three albums. Revolution Number no. 9, I think, is a fantastic piece. I don't know what John was ultimately trying to create with it. I know he said that he was trying to create the image of a revolution through sound, but I do like the fact that it's kind of like a climb. It's kind of like climbing a mountain. You it, um, you begin with multiple layers, starting, 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 then finally, in the middle, you got this cacophony of sound that subsides and then comes up again for a bit, then dies down, comes up again until it finally fades out. So maybe it is supposed to be a revolution. There are There is war sounds on there, but I honestly think it was just an experimentation in sound and tape loops and sound manipulation and how to control multiple layers and layers and layers and do sort of a modern piece with a slight pop sensibility. I think it's a great piece. I've listened to it several times, and when I first heard it, I got the White Album originally for Christmas, uh, Christmas of 81, and I couldn't wait to hear that again, probably because for my eighth birthday, my grandmother on my dad's side got me Pink Floyd's Umagumma. And side two of Umagumma is all four members of Pink Floyd doing solo experimental pieces. The more famous being Roger Waters' is several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave and grooving with a pict. And I loved that stuff. So the fact that the Beatles were doing that stuff was amazing to me. I think Revolution Number no. 9 merits multiple listenings. It's not for everybody. It's not supposed to be for everybody, but it's neither a filler track either. And where it's sequenced and placed on the album is perfect. It definitely is not a filler track. Like I said, I listen to that thing. I put headphones on. I've, I've listened to just the left stereo channel. I've listened to the right stereo channel. I've listened to it both together. I've even done a thing with my headphones where I put the headphone jack slightly in to where it's all mono, so I hear it in mono. However, the official mono mix of Revolution Number no. 9 is a fold down of the stereo. Now, we all know what happened afterwards. You know, Supposedly, Paul did not, did not like it and didn't want it on the album. Paul has never elaborated on the fact that on why he never liked it. And I wish he would, because he wants 15, the, the Carnival of Light out there. 15 minutes of what, judging by the session notes and judging by the Mark Lewis and Beatles rec recording sessions book, is 15 minutes of them mucking about in the studio. Whereas Revolution Number no. 9 seems like a nice, tightly composed piece made up of tape loops. There is a form to it. And again, I think George Martin had a lot to do with the form. Uh, I think John was offended that George Martin let out a bit of truth. I don't think George Martin would lie that he was trying to work with John and trying to create music of the future. But it's a fascinating track, and I'm kind of happy that the, Beatle, that the Beatles, uh, through John, did such a daring track. Have an artist nowadays do a track like that on their albums. And John was smart to keep it to 8 minutes and 15 seconds. Still the longest Beatle track, 8 minutes and 15 seconds. As opposed to 15 and a half for what is supposed to be Carnival of Light. But I think Revolution Number no. 9 is a modern classical masterpiece. And to me, it's at least 
uh, uh, three members of the Beatles, along with Yoko Ono, doing something daring on a pop rock album that I don't think anybody's ever had the guts to do again. That's my take on that. Thank you for watching. And until we meet again.